So welcome to part two of our walk through the rite of baptism of several children. Part one we covered in class Monday night, so we're picking up in the ritual there. Recall where, we, where, where we've been already. Uh, we met at the doors of the church, and the child's name was given. Um, the priest asked the parents what they ask of God's church, and they replied, baptism. And then uh, they were questioned on their own readiness to assume those responsibilities. The godparents were asked about their readiness to assist the parents in those duties. And then the child was signed with the sign of the cross. After that, there is a procession sometimes uh, to where the liturgy of the word is celebrated. We hear the liturgy of the word, including the general intercessions and then the litany of saints for the child. And that brings us to this point in the ritual where we have kind of an immediate preparation before baptism. Um, and we have this prayer of exorcism and an anointing before baptism. And that's going to run us right into as well the renunciation of sin. Uh, well, there's the blessing of water and then the renunciation of sin uh, and profession of faith. This prayer of exorcism and anointing should be seen as a liturgical unit. You can see, uh, by the way, the notes here, uh, by the way, the notes, um, again, are very text heavy. So rather than doing a PowerPoint, um, you're seeing my um, uh, my Word documents and uh, you, you feel free to either watch along um, or print them out and follow along as well, uh, whatever works for you. Um, but you'll notice on my notes and in the ritual as well, there's one heading for prayer of exorcism and anointing before baptism. So there is a, a certain unity between the prayer and then the action of, uh, of uh, anointing that we'll have to look at. Uh, to get the idea of what this um, indicates, what this means, we can turn to the Catechism of the Catholic Church in paragraph 1237. tells us that since baptism signifies liberation from sin, and from its instigator, the devil, one or more exorcisms are pronounced over the candidate. The celebrant then anoints him with the oil of catechumens or lays hands on him. Uh, we usually see the anointing happen. And he explicitly renounces Satan. Now, you, you see this happens um, in succession here in the rite. And again, the catechism is pointing out the unity of these three elements. The, um, <clears throat> the exorcism, the anointing, and the renunciation of Satan all, all go together. So that gives us a clue, I suppose my point is, that gives us a clue into the meaning of the anointing. Uh, it's going to be connected to exorcism and the ren renunciation of Satan. It goes on to say, thus prepared, he is able to confess the faith of the church to which he will be entrusted by baptism. So, uh, this uh, this triple action of exorcism, anointing, and uh, renunciation of Satan is a, pref uh, a preparation. And it's a preparation in order for the next movement of the rite uh, to confess the faith of the church in the, um, in the baptismal rite. And then there's a piece from the Catechism that talks about, in another place, that talks about... Um, Exorcism and what is meant by exorcism. And this is actually in the section on the Catechism on Sacramentals. So it says that in paragraph 1673, when the church asks publicly and authoritatively in the name of Jesus Christ that a person or object be protected against the power of the evil one and withdrawn from his dominion, it is called an exorcism. And so that's what we have here just below in number 49 is a prayer, a public and authoritative prayer in the name of Christ that this person, in this case a child, be protected against the power of the evil one and drawn, uh, withdrawn from his dominion. So that is an exorcism. It says Jesus performed exorcisms. We know that from the Gospels. And from him the church has received the power and office of exercising. And we have a major exorcism, which, which is its own ritual or rite. Uh, but this here goes on to speak about, in a simple form, Exorcism is performed at the celebration of baptism. So while uh, a major exorcism is its own uh, rite, this is a minor exorcism or simple form. Uh, and so you can see here as I bring it up uh, in the purple on the, on the kind of the right hand side of everything, uh, it's shot through a scripture. And again, one of the beauties, uh, the beautiful elements of these prayers of our church is that they take their inspiration uh, generally from, from the scriptures. Um, so uh, I've noted them here in the prayer. And then we'll have a chance to, uh, to unpack and look at some of the, the scriptures that it's referring to below. So the prayer is addressed to God the Father. Almighty and ever-living God, 
you sent your son into the world to cast out the power of Satan, spirit of evil, to rescue man from the kingdom of darkness, and to bring him into the splendor of your kingdom of light. Now, in that first part of the prayer, we uh, it's this kind of anamnesis, or remembering, or recalling, or stating to God what he has already done. So this is the grounds for our confidence in our petition that's to come. So this is what Christ was sent for, to cast out the power of Satan, to rescue us from darkness, and to transfer us into the kingdom of light. So then the prayer goes on, we pray for these children. Set them free from original sin, make them temples of your glory, and send your Holy Spirit to dwell within them. We ask this through Christ our Lord. So there's a triple petition here, um, having to do first with, a, a, what would you say, a negative, a, a the, the removal of something. Set them free from original sin. Uh, now, if you've been paying attention uh, thus far on the right and going on forward, original sin uh, is not mentioned very often in the prayers, uh, in the ritual. Uh, we see it in the in the introduction, the prenotanda, the, the introductory remarks to the sacrament. Um, but in the ritual itself, um, this is pretty much the only time original sin is mentioned. This and then there's another form of this prayer that I cut out. Um, which is interesting because most of the time, I think if you ask Catholics, what does baptism do? The immediate answer is washes away original sin. The rite contains that, and it certainly does, uh, but the uh, the emphasis seems to be elsewhere in the rite. So there is this clear, in the exorcism, prayer, this petition that the child will be set free from original sin, and then it turns to, to the positive. Once, once this has been asked to be removed, well, in a sense, what you could say what takes its place, but what's the positive aspect of this? Uh, the child is made a temple of God's glory, and the Holy Spirit dwells within that child. Um, the scriptures here. Um, you can go back and forth in the notes uh, rather than me scrolling up and down if that helps you. But notice some of the, the elements that are here. This is the, you know, God has sent his son from First John. Beloved, let us love one another for God, uh, for love is of God. And he who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this love, uh, sorry, in this is love, not that we loved, but that God, that he has loved us and sent his son to be the expiation for our sins. Now, I will scroll for a moment. You'll notice that this is uh, connected to uh, just this first line, very simple line. You sent your only son into the world to do these things. This notion of God sending his son is clearly uh, throughout scripture, particularly in the writings of John. But this allusion to God sending his son is shot through with all of this uh, language of the love of God, right? God is love. This is why the son was sent um, to be the expiation for our sins. So when, when the prayer recalls the reason for uh, the, the son being sent, it, it should call to mind, you know, those who know and live scripture, it should call to mind the love of God. Um, this, uh, this is in reference to the power, uh, to cast out the power of Satan, the spirit of evil. You have, for instance, Revelation. Um, uh, John says, I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power of the kingdom of our God and the authority of Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren, the, the accuser of Satan, has been thrown down, right? Cast out, who accuses them night and day before our God. So this is in John's kind of apocalyptic vision of, of Christ's uh, final victory, uh, the casting out of Satan. Uh, and this is given uh, over to the apostles here in Matthew 10. He called to uh, He called to him his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every infirmity. So it's Christ, uh, Christ's victory on the cross that casts out Satan. And the church then, uh, in this case the disciples, are given the authority to do so as well. Um, Exodus. Uh, I might have copied this over. This should be Ezekiel. Yes, Ezekiel in my notes, not Exodus. This should be a Z. Uh, as the, in fact, here, I'll change it. There, Ezekiel. <laughs> as the glory of the Lord entered the temple, by the gate facing east, the Spirit lifted me up and brought me into the inner court, and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the temple. And again, if I scroll up, the prayer is praying that the child may be temples of uh, God's glory. 
right? So the idea here is uh, as, as God dwelt in a unique way in the temple, in the old covenant now, the temple being destroyed, what is the temple? It's the, it's the baptized Christian. And you get this with um, 1 Corinthians now, what, what is it that dwells within the temple uh, of the baptized Christian, but the Holy Spirit? So Paul says, do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. So all of this scripture is kind of uh, packed into this prayer here. Uh, and, and one who's, you know, you start getting into the scriptures. Um, these allusions call forth all of this background. Now, just for fun, uh, I, I said here, for comparison, uh, you can see the, uh, the exorcism in the extraordinary form. So if you want, pause the video. Read this number 49 here again, what the current um, right has. And it's just uh, interesting to note the difference from the pre-Vatican II right, what you would call now the, um, the um, extraordinary form. So before Vatican II, um, it would have been in Latin, but here's what it would have said in English. Uh, just kind of notice the difference. There's more of this direct command to Satan, right? In this prayer up here in 49 um, of, of the current ritual, um, it's a prayer directed to God as a petition that he free the children from original sin, make them uh, temples of the Holy Spirit. Here in the old rite, the, uh, the exorcism is a direct command um, to the evil one in the name of the Trinity. So it says, I cast you out, unclean spirit, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Depart and stay far away from this servant of God, for it is the Lord himself who commands you a cursed and doomed spirit, he who walked on the sea and reached out his hand to Peter as he was sinking. So then, foul fiend, recall the curse that decided your fate once for all. Indeed, pay homage to the living and true God. Pay homage to Jesus Christ, his Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Keep far from this servant of God, for Jesus Christ our Lord and God has free, uh, freely called him to his holy grace and blessed, uh, blessed, uh, to his holy grace and blessed way, and to the waters of baptism. And then the priest chases the, traces the sign of the cross and the child and says, Never dare a cursed fiend to desecrate the seal of the holy cross, which we imprint upon his brow through Christ our Lord. Amen. So you can see there's uh, the, the language there in the, in the old ritual is uh, forceful and, and, and uh, I don't know what you say, uh, rather colorful in its uh, declaration, its command against the evil one. So if you remember, okay, so that was just a little side note. Uh, we move from this prayer of exorcism in 49 to then number 50 down here. Uh, it, look, immediately following this exorcism is the action of the anointing. And so the prayer with the anointing as he anoints each child in the breast with the oil of catechumens, uh, he says, we anoint you with the oil of salvation uh, in the name of Christ our Savior. May he strengthen you with his power who lives and reigns forever and ever. So there's clearly the, the language of strengthening here. But the strengthening is in connection with the exorcism, right? Uh, we, we saw that from the catechism. We see it structurally. The strengthening has to be uh, connected to this uh, defense against the evil one. And we see a little bit of this in, again, the catechism. This is from paragraphs 1293 through 1294 in the purple here. Uh, it just talks about anointing in general. Uh, anointing in biblical and other ancient symbolism is rich in meaning, and it gives us a bunch of this meaning. Uh, oil is a sign of abundance and joy. And you get a few scripture passages for that, so abundance and joy. It cleanses, so an anointing before and after a bath. It limbers, right, the anointing of athletes and wrestlers. Oil is a sign of healing, since it soothes, soothes so, uh, sorry, since it is soothing to bruises and wounds. Some more scripture there. And it makes radiant with beauty, health, and strength. So these are all both um, natural and biblical images of anointing with oil in general. And then it goes on to say that anointing with oil has all these meanings in the sacramental life. And in particular, it's going to highlight now the pre-baptismal anointing with the oil of catechumens signifies cleansing and strengthening, right? So a cleansing, clearly a cleansing from sin and strengthening. Why is strengthening? Well, what's gone before and what's coming up? The before is the, the um, uh, exorcism against the power of the evil one. What's about to come up is, uh, in a moment, is the um, um, renunciation uh, uh, of Satan, 
right? So there's this kind of triple movement. And so the, the anointing is a strengthening for doing battle with Satan. It's as if the, the, um, uh, the one to be baptized is about to go into the water to wrestle with Leviathan, with the, with the serpent, right? Is about to do battle with Satan. There, this is some imagery that the early church fathers in their mystagogical catechesis brings up as Satan is chasing them to the waters of baptism where he'll do battle with them and they're going to come out through God's grace victorious. And so we're, we're, you know, you could even push the imagery even further. We're anointing, we're, 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 we're covering this child in oil, um, so that Satan, you know, he makes the child slippery, right? Oil makes us slippery. So, so the serpent can't get a hold of the child in the waters of baptism. So there's this real strong imagery and the, again, the early church fathers bring this out even more clearly of, uh, of the, uh, of the anointing with this oil on the verge of baptism, having to do with being prepared to do battle with the evil one in the waters of baptism. So they're anointed. And then it says in 52, if the baptistry is located outside of the church or is not within view of the congregation, all go there in procession. And we've already had a chance in class to talk about the meaning of procession. But notice again, movement. Um, from, from this point, we're, we're basically, uh, if, if I remember right, I've got to think we, we are, um, uh, at the place of the, um, we would still be at the place, if I remember right, off the top of my head of the, the liturgy of the word, wherever that's taken place. Um, and now we're moving, though, to where the baptismal font is, right? So this is going to depend on the, the, the architecture and topography of each church. So maybe that it's happening right there and there wouldn't be a procession. So there's practical matters to be considered. In any case, the right, uh, whether or not you are actually moving, the right indicates in several places, at least three places, this motion, this movement, the people of God on pilgrimage. Uh, we've heard the word of God. There's been this preparation, and now we're going to move again to the place where the baptism is going to happen. Um, and, and, you know, the imagery there, again, if we're in procession, we're in this um, um, movement to the baptismal waters, right? The, the evil one is chasing the child to the baptismal waters. We'll see a little bit of this imagery from, I have a quote from the church fathers in a little bit. Right. So this movement is one of a people uh, in haste to the baptismal waters for this uh, saving remedy. Um, as that's being done, there can be sung an appropriate hymn and it mentions Psalm 23. And you can see the language of Psalm 23, some very um, um, fitting language for what's about to happen. Right. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. The shepherd is one who's going to guide the sheep. Right. In verdant pastures, he gives me repose. Beside restful waters, he leads me, right? This is a, a, a psalm to be sung as you're approaching the baptismal font. So he leads me to restful waters, refreshing my soul, guides me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk in the valley, the dark valley, I fear no evil for you are at my side with your rod and your staff that give me courage. Again, if you take up the imagery that we're moving for a reason from one place where there's this exorcism, uh, and anointing to the baptismal waters, that's this imagery of moving through the dark valley before baptism, but yet I fear no evil because it's Christ ultimately who guides us from, from, even from this place to that, to the, from, from the short distance to the baptismal font, it's Christ guiding there. Um, you anoint my head with oil, which is literally what just happened, right? And then this promise of goodness and kindness to follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell uh, dwell in the house of the Lord for years to come is is the promise of uh, the effects of baptism. So and once you read this in the context, right, or sing this in the context of baptism, uh, it takes on an, a new meaning. Um, I think we'll uh, we'll pause there because we'll start a, a new element of the uh, um, of the rite in just a moment.